I hope that everyone has had a great Thanksgiving weekend. For some of you, it's a longer weekend. I guess some people feel sorry for the people who have to live in or work in the stores because they don't uh, have a long weekend. They have to go to work. But uh, I want to begin this morning with a story that took place during the American Revolution. There was a Baptist pastor by the name of Peter Miller who lived in the town of Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And uh, Pastor Miller happened to be close personal friends with General George Washington at the time. But there was another man who lived in Ephrata by the name of Michael Whitman. And Michael Whitman was not a very nice man. He was a mean-spirited individual who opposed the church. He hated the church and everything the church stood for. And he couldn't stand Pastor Miller. Every time Pastor Miller would try and get something accomplished in the town, Whitman would oppose him. And Whitman went out of his way to humiliate the pastor publicly whenever he could. Well, one day, this Michael Whitman was arrested for treason. And he was brought to Philadelphia and tried and found guilty and given the death penalty. When Pastor Miller heard of this, he walked the 70 miles to Philadelphia to see George Washington to plead for mercy for Michael Whitman. Well, when Washington heard the plea, Washington responded by saying, No, Peter, uh, I cannot grant mercy to Michael Whitman. He is guilty of treason, so I cannot pardon your friend. My friend, Pastor Miller responded. He's not my friend. He's my worst enemy. Washington said, now, well, wait a minute, let, let me get this straight. You mean to tell me that you walked, walked 70 miles to plead for mercy for an enemy? And I said, yes. Washington said, well, that makes a difference. I will pardon Michael Whitman, and he did. And so Michael Whitman and Pastor Miller walked back to Ephrata, not as enemies, but as friends. And I think this incident reflects in a very significant way how God has dealt with us. In the same way that Whitman was guilty of a sin worthy of the death penalty, so too we are guilty of sin deserving eternal death. And just like Pastor Miller made that 70 mile trip to Philadelphia, Jesus made the trip from heaven to earth. Now, I'm not sure how far that is, but I'm pretty sure it's more than 70 miles. And Pastor Miller, it was certainly a sacrifice for him to walk that 70 miles, but Jesus made a greater sacrifice for us. He sacrificed his life. And then Jesus went to the Father to plead for mercy for us, his followers. And it was the sacrifice that Jesus made that made all the difference to the Father. And so the Father pardoned us. God is a God of mercy. And God has mercy on us, and I want to talk about that mercy more this morning. But before we can really appreciate God's mercy, there's something else that we need to understand, and that is the judgment of God. The severity of God's judgment against, against sin is not a very popular subject these days. Our faith is much more palatable when we speak of God's love and His mercy and His forgiveness. But that is only part of the picture. Those things are certainly true of God but they do not reveal the entire truth of who God really is. If we're to know more about God and to see Him more completely, then we under, need to understand Him in the fullness of what the Bible has revealed about Him. And to help us in that understanding of God, the story of Noah and the flood is a fuller picture. We see uh, the more complete God emerge. Both His judgment and His mercy can be seen in the, in the uh, story of Noah and the Flood. So, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to begin with chapter 6, verse 5. And uh, I want to read verse 5 to you. It says this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And you'll notice that this verse begins with the phrase, the Lord saw. Now this phrase actually points us backwards to the first chapter of Genesis, and when we see the connection with that first uh, chapter of Genesis, we can understand more about this phrase. Take a look back at Genesis 1, and you re we recall during the creation account 
Uh, in verse 4, it says, God saw that the light was good after he had created light. And then after every time God creates something, we read in these verses, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. Finally, in verse 31, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Creation was good, and that's what God saw. Sin had not yet <clears throat> contaminated God's good creation. But now in chapter 6, what God sees is not good. Rather than seeing what is good, God sees how wicked man had become because something had gone very wrong. Sin had entered the world through Adam and Eve, and all of God's creation was affected by it. What God had created would, became ruined, and sin meant that uh, people were no longer the pure and holy beings that God intended for them to be. Mankind had become horribly corrupt and began a downward spiral that led further and further away from God. People had violently rebelled and become, became utterly depraved without any thought or care about God and His ways. And to go back to verse 5, you'll notice that it's not just the outward behavior that is the problem, man's wickedness, but that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were evil. Sin seeps so deeply into our being that the entire person becomes corrupted, even our thoughts and our inclinations. Text says that every inclination was what? Only evil all the time. That the Hebrew literally reads here, only evil all of the day. That's how bad things were. It's an absolute contrast to God's good creation. It was not possible for conditions to be more opposite of the way God intended. Instead of thanking God for their lives and his creation, people turned on him, cast him out of their lives, and they pursued every evil thing they could think of. And so, what was God's reaction? To, have, to, to how things were. Well, the next verse. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. And this word pain is a, is a powerful and horrific word in the Hebrew language. This word was used of the devastation that parents experienced upon hearing of the death of their child. It's also a word that describes the anguish that a woman felt after having been raped. And this very word is now applied to the way God is feeling towards the wickedness on the earth. It underscores the extreme, the extreme intensity of what God was feeling. You know, when we say God is a triune God, we say that God is three persons in one. And what that means is that God is, is a person. He's a personal God. He has the characteristics of personhood. And that means that he's capable of feelings and emotions very much like we experience ourselves. God did not view this situation on earth as, a, as an unconcerned spectator, but as one who was deeply affected by what was going on. He had created people who were in many ways similar to himself, people that had the capability of making moral choices and returning to God the love and honor and glory that he deserves. But instead they rebelled, mocked, and violated every good thing God had given them. Now, as, as fallen creatures ourselves, I think it's hard for us to fully understand the moral outrage that God must have felt at those who had rebelled against Him when He had done only good towards them. That's what sin is. It's the ultimate act of betrayal. It's the ultimate act of treason against God. And what's really frightening to me is that things today are not really all that different. Sin still permeates the world. Even those who love the Lord still sin at times. You and I sin. Sometimes I wonder if there's a single day any of us can get through without sinning in some form, either by what we do or say or think or what we don't do. And our problem is, is that we really don't see our own sin as being quite so bad. Our, our sin, we, we don't put it in the same category as those horrible Old Testament sins. You know, those were really the, the wicked sins that we read about. To us, our sin seems relatively small, so we don't feel terribly wicked or rebellious when we sin. But you know, the problem is that being guilty of, of any sin is enough to separate us from God forever. That's what James was talking about. He said, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. It's like a car windshield. You know, a little tiny pebble can strike that windshield at just one, one little spot and the whole thing can shatter. The whole windshield is, is, is gone, ruined. And the same is true of our relationship with God. One little sin ruins the whole relationship. We need to be 
careful about how we deal with our own sin. But that really is the question. Having seen how God is grieved towards sin, how do you react to sin? I don't mean the sin of others. It's easy to be appalled at what other people do, right? I'm talking about your own sin. Are you grieved by your own sin? Does it affect you like it affects God? That really is the question. You know, one of the things I learned from this text is that the more pained you are about your own sin, the more holy you are. Because holiness is pain by sin. The more you hate your own sin, the more you see as God sees. The more grieved you are over your own sin, the stronger will be your desire to fight it. And that's where we need to be headed as Christians. That should be our goal. To see sin like God does. To fight it in our lives. Because that is not what the people were doing in Noah's time. People were sinning and they didn't care. How does God react to that? Well, verse 7. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Those who choose to reject God will incur his divine punishment, his divine judgment. And by virtue of his righteous judgment, God decided to destroy what he had created. The reference to men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, birds of the air, is language that once again reminds us of the creation account back in Genesis 1. And so I think that the language, as it points back to Genesis 1, is telling us that God is going to undo creation. He's going to undo all of it, the land, the creatures, humanity. And you know what's really fascinating is if you think of the second verse of the Bible, that's where the creative activity began. Look at Genesis 1, verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And it was from that point that God began His creative activity. And now the flood is going to once again cover the earth with waters, and nothing is going to be left alive. And it is from that very point that God is going to begin again. And he's going to begin again with mankind, only this time not with Adam, but with Noah. Verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This chapter goes on to explain how God told Noah to build an ark, a very, very big boat. And in that ark, he was going to put two of every kind of animal. And that is how God was going to preserve uh, the animals and, the, and Noah and begin again when the flood was over. Now, a lot of people think of this story of Noah and the ark as, as somewhat of a, a fable, a legend, as they do many other Old Testament stories, Daniel in the lion's den, Jonah and the big fish, David and Goliath. They, these stories by, are seen by non-believers as really legends or fables that are just kind of made up. They're not truly historical accounts. Um, but I think what is really interesting is with this uh, story of Noah and the ark is that uh, it's possible that we may have found some physical evidence to show that the story of Noah and his ark is an actual historical event. Last month I was in North Carolina. I had been invited to speak at the National Christian Apologetics Conference. And while I was down in Charlotte, there was a press conference that was held by two groups of explorers. A, Chinese group and an American group. And these groups were showing evidence that they believe they have found what is actually Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat in Turkey, the country of Turkey. And uh, I was very skeptical, uh, you know, because you hear stories from time to time about other people who discovered the Ark, and uh, it doesn't really amount to too much. And so, but I went to see what was going on. And I have to say, I was quite impressed with what I heard. I really wasn't familiar with what was, uh, uh, what was happening uh, up on that mountain. But these, uh, this Chinese group of explorers, who are Christians, uh, went up there and they uh, took video. And I want to show you a clip of some of what they found up there. Now, you know, there, there's no guarantee that this is Noah's Ark. Uh, you can reach your own conclusion. But with the help of Victor, where's Victor? Thank you, Victor. Victor helped me. This was a long, much longer video. It was about 12 minutes long. And thanks to Victor's help, we cut, cut this down to about four minutes. But I want to show you what they found and uh, see what you think about it. Despite a hostile
hostile weather and political situation, the expedition team carried out the latest arc search for a whole year. And finally, in October 2009, the team successfully entered the wooden structure and made the video recording. During the search, the team entered seven spaces. Wooden connections are found, and knocking at the wall makes a sound of wood. The third space. This space is as tall as 5 meters. The wall is also shaped in a concave curve and slightly tilted. The team had to absolute down there. There was a disgusting smell in the space that makes breathing difficult. Knocking on the floor, the team members can hear the sound of wood, and the hollow sound suggests that there is another floor underneath. The fourth space. The fourth space is like a box. The wall, the ceiling, and the floor are all made of wood, and it's about two meters in height, width, and length. There is a wooden beam with wooden nails on the wall. It is believed that animals were once tied to these nails. The seventh space. This space is 5 meters high and about 10 to 12 meters wide. It's curved in shape, and the structure of the wall is similar to the third space. Since it's located in a dangerous position, the team could only peek from the top, and they found three air vents that might have served as windows. According to the Bible, the Noah's Ark is about 150 meters long. These wooden spaces distribute horizontally and are altogether more than 30 meters wide. Therefore, it is highly probable that the remains of Noah's Ark have been found. Well, I don't know, uh, but what I uh, heard at the press conference was that there is additional uh, information that the explorers uh, found this year when they had gotten back up in the springtime. And uh, they had actually gotten underneath that floor and they determined there were actually three levels to this structure, which is what uh, Noah's Ark was uh, the blueprints for. And then in the very bottom level, they found uh, a huge amount of animal waste uh, from animals that do not inhabit uh, that part of the, uh, of the, of the area. So uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting to think about that this. It's hard to believe that there's any other explanation. That's the problem. This thing is so high up on the mountain, it's like 13,000 feet. It's way above the tree line. 
So to think people could have brought materials up there con to construct this huge structure, it just doesn't make any sense. There would be no reason to do that. The conditions are too harsh. And so you've got this gigantic thing. And, and uh, what they were saying was that it appears even now, they, in the ensuing trips, they've determined that it, the, 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 this boat is in two pieces within the glacier. And what's happening, it's in a glacier and it's slowly coming down the mountain. But as it does, it's deteriorating and breaking apart. And so they, uh, they want to go up as many times as they can before more damage happens to really see if, uh, you know, they can determine what this is. They took some wood splinters back and they carbon dated them and they were approximately 5,000 years old, which would actually put it right at the time of Noah's of the flood. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's pretty fascinating to think about that this could be, uh, could be uh, the Ark. It's very, very interesting. We'll have to wait and see what uh, develops from that. But I want to talk more about Noah, but before I do, I want to address another question that is often raised when it comes to this, to the flood, and that is the question of why God's judgment had to be so severe against all of mankind with the flood. Why did everybody have to die? Doesn't that seem a little bit cruel and harsh? Crit critics of the Bible will often ask, and maybe Christians themselves can wonder, if God is a God of love, why does he have to be so severe in his judgment? Well, I think in response we need to understand and remember that God is a God of love, but that does not negate his holiness. God is perfectly holy, and he permitted man to live in the garden in direct relationship with him as long as man remained holy. God created humans without sin so that we could live in the very presence of God himself. And that's... That's why God said that, listen, in the day that you sin, is the day you will die. Right? Sin destroys the holiness that we have, and we no longer can be in God's presence. We forfeit our right to life if we sin. And so God told Adam and Eve, in the day you sin, you will die. Paul expressed it well. If we can, that is. There we go. In Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. Death is the consequence we suffer if we sin, God's perfect holiness will not accept the pollution of sin. So when God judges sin, he does only what his holiness and his moral perfection demand. So to ask why God let so many die in the flood, I think is really the wrong question. The real question is much bigger. The real question is why does God let anyone die? I mean, it wasn't just the people in the flood who died. We all die. It doesn't matter how you die, right? We're all, the fact is we're all going to die. And the reason is because it is part of God's judgment against sin. It is part of the consequence that we will experience. But for believers, that physical death does not mean that it is the end of existence. For us, physical death in Christ is the beginning of a new life. We are saved from eternal death because of Jesus Christ. We are saved. It brings up an interesting thought. You know, as Christians, we say we're, we're saved, but what is it that we're ultimately saved from? A lot of people would answer that question and say, well, we're saved from sin, or we're saved from hell. And those things are true, but ultimately, ultimately we are saved from God's judgment. That is what we are saved from. We deserve God's judgment because we are guilty of sin. And that is exactly where God's mercy comes in to play. Mercy comes to our rescue. And God's mercy is far more abundant than we realize. Think about this for a second. God would have every right to take your life the very moment that you sin. God told Adam and Eve that the day you die, excuse me, the day you sin, you will die. But they didn't die that day. Because of his love and mercy, God granted them more time. And thankfully, he does the same for us. But there have been times in the Bible where God exercises his right to take a person's life the moment they sin. You see this on occasion in, Levitic in Leviticus 10. You might recall the story of Aaron's sons, Ahab and Abihu. They offered un unauthorized incense and fire to God. I think they did it in a joking way, in a comical way. And God struck them dead on the spot. There was another incident in 2 Samuel where the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back to Jerusalem, and the Ark of the Covenant was so holy that no human being could touch it. They carried it on poles so that it wouldn't be touched. And a guy named Uzzah reached his hand out and touched the Ark and was struck dead right on the spot. 
In the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. They were struck dead on the spot. God has the right to do that. He's completely justified because that's the rule. You sin, you die. But yet he's so merciful to us. We just keep on, we just keep on living. And these examples should remind us that every breath we take is due to God's mercy. That's how much mercy we receive in our lives. Well, let me look more closely at God's mercy. In, in verse 9 of Genesis 6, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. God shows mercy to Noah because Noah found favor in God's eyes. Why? Well, it says Noah was righteous and blameless, and he walked with God. This is in sharp contrast to the way the rest of the world has been described. The rest of the world is just totally wicked, and the inclination of the hearts is evil all the time. Not so with Noah. Noah is unique in his desire to honor God, and God is going to spare his life and save the human race through Noah. With Noah, there is hope for mankind. So let me paint a picture of God's mercy for a moment. With Noah, God is going to use a single man who's the most righteous and blameless man in the world to save mankind in a wooden boat and thus give hope to the human race. And that same kind of mercy would be seen later on when God would again use a single man, the most righteous and blameless man in the world, to save mankind. Except instead of in a wooden boat, it would be on a wooden cross. And through him, the human race would have hope. Mercy means that we do not have to suffer the ultimate punishment for sin. But make no mistake, God's judgment on sin is extreme. But the horrible, tortured death of Jesus on the cross demonstrated the extreme nature of God's mercy as well. God will go to the extent of sacrificing his own son so that he can have mercy on us. So for the world, there will be a severe judgment for sin. But for those in Christ, there will be a severe mercy. So, as followers of Christ, how should all of this mercy that we've received, how does that affect the way that we live? Well, Jesus told us very simply in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Jesus is saying that we should deal with other people the exact same way that God has dealt with us. Showing mercy. How do we show mercy? We can do that every single day of our lives if we want to. We can show greater tolerance of those whose actions might irritate us. We can show greater patience to those who frustrate us. We cannot be so quick to criticize, but quick to forgive. See, the world needs to see evidence that God is merciful. So if those who have experienced God's mercy can show that mercy, can reflect it so that it can be seen, the world is going to take notice. You know, I'm thankful that God is a God of mercy, but in today's world, we don't hear much thanks for God's mercy compared to the number of times God is accused of not being merciful. You know? People question this all the time. People say, where was God when my friend died? Or how come God let me lose my job? Or why doesn't God give me as big a house as the person down the street? People claim that God just isn't being fair with them. We think that somehow God is at fault if things go wrong for us. It's as if we think God owes us something better. Well, does he really? Does he owe us mercy? I think not. God owes us nothing of the sort, and yet his mercy continues to flow into our lives, even though we sin and are at times rebellious. But you know, in reality, I think we've become so accustomed to God's constant mercy that we begin to demand it. There's an illustration that I want to share with you, and it's my favorite illustration of all time, I think. R.C. Sproul's Bible teacher, and he tells this story, which I'm going to share with you, which I think illustrates that sometimes we demand mercy because we've gotten used to it. He tells a story of when he was a college professor, and in this course that he was teaching, he assigned three term papers that were due throughout the semester. And he said, here's the rule. When that day comes and your term paper is due, you have to turn it in. If you don't turn it in, you will get a zero. There are no late papers. Everybody understand? Yes, the class totally, fully understand. Papers late, you get a zero. 
So the semester goes along, the first due date comes for the paper, and uh, one student raises his hand in the class and says, uh, Dr. Sproul, I'm sorry, I don't have my paper. I got so busy, I had so many other things going on. Can you please give me a little more time? He said, okay, I'll give you some more time to get it done. So then the second date came for the second paper. And this time, four or five students raised their hand. They said, Dr. Sproul, we, we don't have our papers. We're so sorry. We had so much other work. We didn't budget our time. Can you please give us extra time? He said, OK, I'll give you a little extra time. Well, then the third term paper came due. And half the class raises their hand and says, Dr. Sproul, we don't have our papers. We'll get them to you as soon as we can. No problem. So with that, Dr. Sproul takes out his, his grade book. And he goes, Thomas, you got your paper? He said, no, sir, zero. Richard, you got your paper? No, sir, zero. Charles, you got your paper? No, sir, zero. And the class, they go, wait a minute. That's not fair. You can't give us a zero for not having our paper. It's not fair. Now, were they demanding fairness? Or were they demanding mercy? Okay. Fairness was the, oh, the rules, right? The rules are the, what's fair. You don't have your paper, you get a zero. He had extended mercy, and now they were beginning to demand it. And sometimes that's how we are with God. We've gotten so used to His mercy that when we don't get it, we say God's not being fair. Well, let me tell you something. You don't want what's fair when it comes to God. You want mercy. What's fair is that in the day we sin, we die. Period. God owes us nothing beyond that. And yet, God has decided that He loved us so much that even the death of His own Son was not too great a price to pay for our salvation. Jesus dealt with us Excuse me, God dealt with Jesus so severely that we were then allowed to escape the divine judgment against sin. We have received mercy through God, through Christ. So I think what we need to do is reorient our hearts, reorient our thinking. We need, rather than question God when things go wrong, rather than claim that he's not being fair with us, we need to have an attitude of thanks for all the mercy that he has lovingly bestowed upon us. There's so much of it that we, we can't even name it. God has been incredibly merciful to us, and he's also a judge against sin, and so we need to have a balanced view of God. We need to love and worship God in his fullness. We need to praise God for his severe judgment against sin, and thank him for his severe mercy. Toward us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much.